Thanks very much, Shiv, and I hope everybody can hear me. I think I've got a few technical problems at my end as well, and I'm hoping that they'll be resolved uh, fairly shortly. Um, uh, welcome uh, to the webinar, and it's great to be here. I don't know if you've got a, a webcam picture of me, um, Shiv, that I've lost access to my webinar, although I have the slides in front of me anyway. Shiv, perhaps you could just let me know if you've got yes, access yep. to my... Yes, yep. We okay. can see your web webcam, yes. I can't see you, but it's okay. Um, I, I just wanted to talk firstly about really how this program was conceived, and I think Shiv has already mentioned that um, you know one of the drivers was really the work of the Ombudsman Project, and that led to, I think, um, a, a, a quest, if you like, for more information about how to manage difficult behaviour in different sorts of contexts, in particular in the RTI context. And of course, all of you have attended the two-day program that was put together with Justin Tui through the OIC. And I just wanted to recap briefly on some of the things from that program that will be extended in this webinar. And basically in that program, we talked quite a lot about using uh, communication skills to communicate better with applicants and in fact all stakeholders involved in RTI matters. And as part of that conversation, we talked about the importance of having procedural explanation and how that could impact on the way that uh, people dealt with a problem, and it might even assist in terms of lowering anxiety levels. We talked about the importance of summary, and that's really when you summarise them back to make sure that the other person is heard correctly. We also talked about using reflection, and um, that is when you use direct words back to a person who's raised something with you. That not only shows understanding, but it also gives you a chance to check understanding. And really, the, the purpose of summary and reflection are not only around empathic listening and showing that you are listening carefully, but also if the other person has a disability or is just anxious and confused and may not be taking everything in, Summary and reflection skills are critical in ensuring that they're actually understanding what they're saying and that everything is clear between the two of you. We talk quite a lot about listening skills and the importance of listening for a few minutes uninterrupted, particularly with some folks. And then we talked about some more specific skills. And when we talked about more specific skills, most of you will remember that we did a lot of work around the Harvard Seven Element Program and that using that both as a preparation tool and also as something to assist you on the way through your negotiation. And of course one of the things that, um, that we also talked about was that you really have to determine in which sorts of matters it's worthwhile to negotiate. Now one um, particular skill area that we talked about, which was derived very much from Bill Eddy's work, and Bill will be talking shortly, is around connecting with uh, what are known as NAR statements. And that's really showing through your uh, listening skills, through direct communication, uh, that you are showing empathy, attention, and respect. And there are examples that we used in the materials, for example, you might say to a person, I can understand that this is difficult and frustrating. And again, you might say that you do want to pay attention to what's going on and listen carefully to what the person is saying. And also showing some appreciation that the other person wants to resolve the issue and it's difficult for them to raise some of these issues with you. Showing empathy, attention and respect is often um, a really important piece of connecting so that you can understand what the person wishes to say to you. And again, all of this is around communicating more effectively. Now, this really leads us into a, a piece which I think Bill is going to mention as well, and it really is about the fears about using um, different strategies with different people. Now, we talked a lot in the program about high-conflict behaviours, but Bill is also an expert in what, what are known as high-conflict personalities. That is personality types that may be more readily involved in conflict situations. Now, when we're talking about high conflict personality types, we're not suggesting that you would be diagnosing people. What we're really suggesting is a generic set of skills that might be useful when you're actually dealing with difficult behaviours. And again, all of this needs to be deeply respectful. And you really need to approach it, I think, from a sincere perspective. However, looking at it in terms of the fears that people might have, 
when they engage in an RTI session with you, or even just in general about any more generic dispute that they may have, is important in terms of understanding um, the way to respond. I might hand over to Bill for a moment just to talk about what some of those fears are in terms of um, empathy, attention, respect, and the fears that the disputants may have when they first engage with you. Bill. Thank you, Tanya. And first of all, I just want to say I'm really glad to be a part of this program for the OIC. Yes, what uh, Tanya says very true. Uh, so the different personalities that I think of as high conflict personalities, and I'll be talking about them further, uh, have some characteristic traits that mental health professionals have identified. But what I'd like to say with each of those, they each have a fear but it doesn't matter which fear they have. The same types of language can really be helpful to them. So your ear responses are partly your body language, which shows empathy, shows that you're willing to pay attention and respect. But also, there are certain phrases that seem to help calm people with high conflict personalities. The sense that I want to assist you. I respect your efforts. Um, they're just rules we all have to follow. And hopefully you can hear my tone of voice in this, because it's really a sense that you're on the same team with the person, that the other person and you are working together to solve a problem, rather than that you see the other person as the problem. So the tone of voice really matters, and we'll talk more about this. But that's an important part of empathy, attention, and respect statements, is that you're really communicating I'm with you on this, uh, this problem rather than against you. You know, statements like, I'll work with you on this. Uh, I care about you and want you to succeed. The idea here is people with high conflict personalities need more than simply a reflection of what they've said. They need to get a sense that you're invested in helping them. Now, you don't necessarily have to say you care about them. Uh, it really depends on the situation. But you want your tone of voice and the words you use to imply you're working with them rather than against them. And that's probably the most important part of the threshold of working with high conflict personalities is that you want to be seen as a friendly person rather than as an enemy. So that's all I want to say for now. But I'll get to these other personality types in a little bit. I think, Tanya, you were going to pick up a little bit more here about the ear statements. <coughs> yeah, Bill, Actually, I, I've, I've got a slight issue with my webinar at the moment. And I'm just wondering, could, could you run through what some of those fears and concerns are? And I'll jump back in in a moment. Sure. I, I think really some of the, the drivers and some of the concerns that people have are really um, derived from what we uh, discussed a lot in the seminar, which is really a cycle of distress that happens with people once they get into particular behaviours. And that, that fear is that um, really that there may be an internal distress uh, that a person feels, but they may see that really as being a result of external factors. But Bill, I'm just wondering if you could jump in. I'm just trying to reset my webinar as we speak. Sure. Yeah, I, I can say more about that. The idea is these folks have inside of them a lot of these fears, and they trigger them themselves. So it isn't necessarily something you're doing or saying or being, but the way you are with them might help soothe and calm some of those fears they have. As I mentioned in, in the slide, being abandoned, being seen as inferior, being ignored, being dominated, taken advantage of, these seem to underlie the different personalities that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. So the idea here is you're working with them, not against them, but the cautions about your statements include, this doesn't mean you believe them, doesn't mean you agree with the content they're saying, it just means you're trying to connect as a human being. You're willing to avoid saying things that you'll fix it for them, to try to calm them down. And unfortunately, that's a common tactic that professionals use. They say, oh, I'll just take care of it. Leave me alone. Um, or that's what their tone of voice implies. Instead, you want to be with them, helping them solve their problem with you, 
not solving it for them. That's another very important point about high conflict personalities. They need to participate in the solutions, otherwise they fight the solutions. So don't do it for them, but stay connected to them. And you may need to repeat these ear statements uh, again and again in a conversation. Sometimes it calms people down enough. And I, I like to say about 90% of the time, an ear statement really calms people enough so that they can then focus on problem solving. So you keep an arm's length relationship, not too close, not too rejecting. Also important to know is you don't have to listen forever. Uh, people with high conflict personalities have a lot of distress and anxiety, and so they can be very talkative. And you probably notice that they can talk and talk and talk. If you have the opportunity to hear them tell their story, that's, that's great. But one thing to know about people with high conflict personalities is they don't get over it by telling their story. The average person gets it off their chest, then they feel better. People with high conflict personalities repeat the same story over and over again to different people, and sadly enough, they don't really feel better from it. Therefore, if you've had a chance to hear their story or you have limited time, is you can interrupt them with an ear statement and say something like, wow, I can see how important this is to you. Now, how I can help you today is to focus on this next task. So by saying that, you're not shutting them down as much as refocusing them. So think in terms of giving them an ear statement and refocusing them on something else, such as what you can do now. The other thing I wanted to mention is you don't have to use words for ear statements. Basically, you can, your body language or tone of voice may help. Now, much of your contact may be over the phone, and tone of voice really carries well over the phone. So you don't have to use any particular words, but have your tone of voice communicate interest, sincerity, empathy, attention, and respect. OK, let's, let's go to this uh, next little cartoon, which I find enjoyable uh, here. As he says, I'd rather be a huge part of the problem than a tiny part of the solution. And in many ways, this is, seems to be what high conflict personalities are saying. Uh, what's interesting, though, is they don't announce themselves in advance. This would certainly make it a lot easier. The other thing is, generally, they don't actually realize that that's what they're doing. They're quite defensive and trying to help themselves cope and don't really realize the impact they have on everyone around us. So, uh, at this point, I can start talking about the differences between behavior and personalities, unless there's something Tanya wants to fit in here. Uh, no, Bill, but I think, again, just restating uh, what I said earlier and what we also talked about in the program, and that is that uh, we're not trying to teach you how to diagnose a high conflict personality. And the term that we tend to use is high conflict behavior to describe a group of behaviors that many who work in the conflict resolution area find difficult to deal with. So when we're talking about behaviors, uh, we're talking about a range of behaviors. And you can see those on the left there, that those all or nothing type of behaviors, uh, emotional extremes, extreme behaviors in terms of lying, stealing, spreading rumors, threatening violence, and focusing on blaming others rather than uh, thinking about oneself. Now, those high conflict behaviors may actually stem from what's called high conflict personalities and may actually stem from underlying mental health issues. Um, but sometimes they may also be related to situational stress. And I think, as Bill rightly points out, some people can show high conflict behaviors. We all can when we're stressed and we're anxious and we're worried. For some folks, though, this is normally part of their operating existence. And although we're not teaching you to consider that in terms of diagnosis of person, personality types, we do think it's helpful to explore what some of those characteristics are in terms of high conflict personality. So Bill, I'll hand back over to you. 
Okay, great. Yeah, and I, I do want to make this distinction. Uh, people are very cautious to not label people as having personality disorders or telling people they have a high conflict personality. On the other hand, I find that it's helpful to basically look at the difference here. And perhaps a good analogy is between behavior and personality is, for example, looking at someone who, say, is, uh, is, has a drinking uh, issue versus someone who's an alcoholic. You have a different approach. So what we're going to talk about today is different approaches if you think someone has a high conflict personality, although you can apply it to anyone who's upset. So basically, the difference with a high-conflict personality from simple high-conflict behavior is that they have a repeated pattern of high-conflict behavior. It's not just the situation, and it continues to repeat over and over again in many areas of their lives, generally. So they bring this personality approach, and personalities are known as how you regularly deal with feelings, how you regularly think, and how you regularly behave. So these repeated patterns are part of a personality, and so there's some things to know. First is they're, they're consistently defensive, highly defensive about their own behavior. So one of the things we're going to emphasize is not trying to confront them on their behavior, like you might do with a friend who's engaged in some high conflict behavior. So with these folks, when you confront them directly, especially angrily, their behavior tends to escalate instead of de-escalate. So they get more agitated rather than more calm, like a friend might if you said, hey, listen, listen to me. So with these folks, ear statements help calm the defensiveness, but there's going to be other strategies we need to talk about too. Ordinary methods of conflict resolution frequently don't work if this is a high conflict personality. With people simply with some high conflict behavior, you might try insight. You might try logical arguments. All of those things that people are used to doing. But I would suggest that 80% of our interactions with high conflict people is a waste of time because we're trying to make them understand, make them see the part they play in their own problem. If they have a high conflict personality, this means they will be blind to that. And often I, I ask people to say, you know, what percent uh, do the high conflict people seem to take responsibility for solving the problems they're in? And pretty universally, it's zero percent. They really don't see any part, and that helps you understand it's a psychological barrier. It's kind of like a blind person. So let's talk about these issues of high conflict personalities. What's different about them from the average person? Number one is this lack of self-awareness. They really don't look at their own behavior in the situation and become very defensive if you want them to. They don't see their role in their own conflicts, and it's helpful to know that. So you're not trying to make them understand, make them see, uh, all of that, having insight into their own behavior, all of that's a waste of time. It really will save you a lot of frustration if you don't try to focus on that, because it's part of the nature of the personality. The second is they don't change their behavior. Since they're not looking at their own behavior, they really aren't trying to change their behavior. In fact, they put a lot of energy into defending it, which is why negative feedback really doesn't help them. They just put all their energy into de defensiveness. So they're stuck in this cycle of high conflict thinking. And we have to pay attention to our responses because it's easy to trigger and reinforce this cycle of high conflict thinking when that really isn't your intent. The third part is they externalize responsibility. They say things just happen to them. They chronically feel helpless and vulnerable and powerless. 
And so their interactions with people are trying to gain some kind of control, some kind of power over other people, and that leads to their bad behavior. So if we can back off from focusing on their past behavior, et cetera, we can help by focusing on the future, and, and we're going to talk about things you can do. So understand that their efforts to attack others, control others, come from their problems, not from you doing something wrong. And one of the sayings that uh, we have with High Conflict Institute is, it's not about you when you're personally attacked. So don't focus on defending yourself. Focus on getting them to the next task and understanding what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But keep in mind they're preoccupied with specific targets of blame. It may be a person, or it may be a group, or an organization. And they go through life trying to find out who it is that's causing them all their trouble. And it's really a misattribution because the problem is mostly generated from within. There's another example of a cartoon with someone who just experiences this lack of self-awareness, lack of behavior change. Basically, he's saying, what sort of flowers say, I promise to obey the restraining orders? And I always get a chuckle out of this because he's not looking at himself at all and doesn't realize how he got into that situation. And the problem, the pattern continues. And his own defensive behavior, he's trying to hold on to this relationship, will probably get him put in jail. Of course, if he sends those flowers, that's third-party contact, and that violates many restraining orders. So the idea here is understanding that they don't understand their own past behavior and don't put energy and time into that. Now, let me talk about some of these different personalities and see if <clears throat> you, uh, uh, later on, we'll give a chance for questions if you have any here. The first of these five is what I call, for practical purposes, the love you, hate you personality type. Mental health professionals see the extreme version of this as borderline personality disorder, but as Tanya said, we're not teaching you to diagnose personalities just wanting you to beware of patterns of behavior so that you change your strategies. And certainly don't ever tell somebody you think they have a personality disorder. Your life will become much more difficult from that point forward. So characteristics, they fear being abandoned, clinging and manipulation. What would that look like in, in your practice? A lot of phone calls, uh, a lot of demands for attention. They're often doing that not because of the issue, but because they want to feel that you're connected with them, that you care about them. Um, they may seek revenge and vindication if they feel they have been abandoned. And they're going to show you, they're going to prove to you. And some of your repeat applicants who keep coming back and coming back are keeping trying to kind of hold on to this relationship, but in an angry way because they don't like being abandoned. When they feel that their case is over, um, it often feels like abandonment to them, so they stay aggressively involved. Their mood swings may go quickly from being quite friendly to being quite angered. And then you think, oh, they're so angry, they'll never talk to me again. Then they calm down and become friendly again. It's a disconnect. So the thing to do um, and let's go to the next slide and talk about what some of the responses might be, is really staying calm and matter of fact when they get angry. So you don't want to go on the roller coaster that they're on. You basically want to stay calm, matter of fact, even though they're angry, even though they're really friendly, because it can go both ways. Uh, listening briefly with empathy and giving them ear statements, telling them, Wow, I can see your frustration, and I want to help you succeed here. So let's help you move on with your life and do what I can do. Here's what I can do for you today. They like feeling that you're invested in them, even though you don't want to sound like you're too close to them. 
So acknowledging that they're upset and then focusing on them, what you can do next. Having clear boundaries is quite important with this personality type because they push the boundaries. They want special treatment, and it's important not to give them special treatment. Just matter-of-factly say, you know, I, I can't do that, but this is what I can do. Being consistent and predictable. If you want to communicate by email, responding to that. If you're communicating by phone, responding to requests for phone calls. The main thing is this moderate emotional range of behavior coming from you tends to calm them down somewhat and help you build the future of uh, working together with them, brief as it may be. So that's some thoughts on the, the love you, hate you type of personality. Bill, I think we're going to go through to what's known as the narcissistic um, type. And I, I should point out too that it, it, the estimates about how many or what percentage of the population falls within the four types that Bill will be talking about today varies. And I think, Bill, you've referred in the past to a study in 2002 and another one in 2008 which suggested that as many as 15% of the uh, US population may fall into one of these categories or um, actually meet a DSM-4 category in relation to mental illness. And, and that's the uh, amended DSM-4. I should point out that the DSM, and I think we mentioned it in class, stands for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is currently uh, a new version is coming out. And it's not known whether, in fact, that new version will mean that there are even more people that fall within uh, some of these different uh, types because they've been regraded. However, what Bill is using is some very uh, rough measures. Now, often when I go into a workplace dispute, I will hear that somebody else is a narcissist. Um, and of course, you know, this is problematic because <laughs> um, it's always problematic, I think, when people diagnose um, another person as a narcissist. But I think many of us have encountered at different points um, people who act in a very superior manner. And perhaps we might talk about that um, if you like, personality type now. Sure. And let me actually briefly comment on the DSM. And I'm glad that you mentioned that and that the, the results, uh, uh, something may be changing. It's actually they, the DSM-5, they decided uh, the same 10 personality disorders. They don't have new research going with it. They're basically reinforcing what's been established, but the research uh, the most recent research, which was published in 2008, did indicate that maybe 15% or more of the U.S. population uh, would meet the criteria for one or more personality disorders, and that that is more than it was 20 years ago when the DSM-4 came out. It's hard to know if it's because of a more thorough, comprehensive research methodology, or if it's increased in society. Um, my, my personal view from reading a lot of the research is it it's, appears to be increasing in society. And we're certainly seeing, in terms of complaints and legal disputes, an increase in these kinds of personalities bringing problems to court that have more to do with their personality, perhaps, than legal issues, although many of them do honestly have legal issues. So we have to treat that. Uh, with full respect. In terms of the narcissistic personality, actually one more comment I wanted to make about all these personalities is think of it in terms of having a private working theory. In other words, in your own mind you might think, I think I'm dealing with a narcissist right now, but you keep that private. And what you see today in the office, as Tanya said, is people starting to say, oh, so-and-so is a narcissist and so-and-so is a narcissist. And it's important, especially when people are in close relationships, that, that that really stirs things up unnecessarily. With that said, the narcissistic type of uh, high-conflict person seems to be very preoccupied with themselves and wanting to be seen as very superior to those around them. And that gets them in a lot of conflicts. People don't like dealing with people who think they're better than everyone else. How it may come up in the work that all of you are doing 
is that they can be insulting, they can be demeaning, and they can be very demanding. Uh, they often have a sense of entitlement that they deserve special treatment. And there's no reason for that except their personalities. They also seem to lack empathy for others. So they maybe don't care much about you, and they don't care necessarily much about the other people in their lives. Sometimes they'll use the word, sometimes they won't. But you may notice that this is a pattern of behavior that you're dealing with. And it's, uh, it can be very difficult because they, they tend to personally attack the people who are most likely to help them. So let's talk a little bit about what to do. What you want to do is not get hooked into responding to their insults, but be respectful. Uh, resist the urge to insult them, which could be very strong. Um, many people you may find public figures telling each other they're narcissistic and uh, trying to, to insult them back, and it makes it look like two people, uh, two narcissists arguing with each other. So you don't want to give that appearance uh, yourself. Resist their efforts to receive special treatment and basically point out that you just have to follow the policies and procedures. And as we go through this, I'll repeat that in several of the personalities, is don't make it personal. It's not about you. It's not about them. It's just about the policies. It's just rules that we all have to follow. Also praise them for some positive effort or skill. And research tells us if you praise somebody for a quality they just have, such as strength or intelligence or beauty, that it, it doesn't really help that much. That what's more effective is praising people for their efforts and learning skills. And this particularly helps with people with narcissistic personality types because they're always underneath, very deep underneath. They're not even conscious of it. They're always trying to prove that they're okay because underneath they may have this fear of being inferior. So you want to recognize that that's a sore spot for them. And if you can give them some positive reinforcement and say, wow, you know, you really did a good job in preparing that form or something else, uh, providing me with information, sometimes that really makes them more manageable. Uh, there's a term some people use, and that's called feeding a narcissist. It's as if they're starving for recognition. And so give it to them, but only if it's honest. Um, if it's not accurate or you don't feel it, just don't bother with that. Now, let's look at another personality type that can be difficult. And this is the antisocial type. They say that perhaps half the prison population has antisocial personalities because they repeatedly get into the same types of trouble. Uh, but you're more likely to deal with them as con artists, people who are good at telling stories, good at being fast, and catching people off guard, and no one knows what happened until they're gone. If you looked at a fear for these folks, it's of being dominated. They put a lot of energy into trying to dominate other people, you and other people uh, weaker than themselves. They especially like to pick on other people. And they like fighting with um, uh, organizations. They like fighting with the rules. They want to dominate rather than be dominated. One thing I might add about all these personalities is that their behavior fat sabotages themselves. So they engage in things that trigger feelings for the people around them of wanting to dominate them. So for example, a lot of these folks may end up in prison, which is the last thing they wanted, because they wanted complete freedom. Same with someone with the love you, hate you, borderline type, is they don't want to be abandoned, but their behavior tends to push people away. And the narcissistic type they put people down, and so people want to put them down. And so they create the problems they're trying to solve. But with that in mind, it can help to recognize these patterns of behavior. 
The antisocial types disregard social rules and laws. They think they don't apply to them. They may lie a lot, be very deceptive, even when they're telling stories that can be found out. So it's easy to feel like they're probably right, but if you did your research, you'd find out that they aren't. Uh, some of them actually enjoy hurting people, like dominating, um, and they really lack, lack remorse. They don't care the damage they do to others, including you. So some thoughts in dealing with this type is basically maintaining a healthy skepticism uh, in general. And you can do this with everybody. I have a saying that I never believe anybody more than 95%, including myself. Uh, I never know when my own brain is playing tricks on me. So you can say, I would need to see some documentation of that. Uh, it's okay to say, you know, I'm not sure, or that sounds unusual. Can you back that up with something? But doing that with empathy, attention, and respect. Paying attention to your gut feelings. With antisocial types, you may feel that there's a little element of danger here. You're getting into dangerous territory. And that's because they're pushing into, uh, they want to push people to do favors that shouldn't be done. People get in trouble sometimes trying to help out antisocials. So it's OK to set limits uh, with them, but do it respectfully. So basically, explaining policies and procedures require certain actions and prevent you from doing other actions. <clears throat> well, let's go on to another personality type now, which I know that um, some in the RTI area found, find very difficult to deal with. And that's the very dramatic or histrionic type. Um, who really drives to be the center of attention and can be quite dramatic in terms of the way that they deal with things and can create a, a lot of drama in, in their presentation and also in the way that they may deal with you on the phone. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm hoping that society in general will start learning about these personality types because people get taken in by them and then make your work much more difficult. So realizing that this is part of who they are, that the drama um, is just kind of stirring the pot and a drive to be center of attention rather than necessarily that there's any issue that goes with the intensity of involvement that they have. So it's, it's, and all of these are unconscious. You can't say, look, you're trying to be the center of attention, cut it out. They just get more upset and defensive. So instead, it's, wow, I can hear how concerned you are. Sounds like this is an important issue to you. Now we're going to need to move on to the next task or topic. So when you think about it, the drama that they bring is something that you can gently listen to briefly and then interrupt the drama and move on to other tasks. Um, it may take extra time to get work done with them that might take a little bit of time with someone else. Something I do is I make notes before I meet or talk to someone I think has a histrionic personality. I make notes of what I want to accomplish because you easily forget that when you're dealing with someone with one of these types of personalities. Now, basically the last personality I want to get to is the paranoid type of personality that feels I'll be betrayed by you. I can never trust you. And this type of personality is, is, some, is seen by some as the most likely to file complaints and lawsuits against their employers and against the government and against the police because they really do honestly believe that people are out to get them, harass them, etc. So they, they have these endless doubts. And it's really sad when you think about all of these because they're creating the problems they're trying to solve. They alienate people and then wonder why people turn against them. One thing is they can bear long-term grudges and you won't necessarily even know it. So it's helpful to keep your correspondence and relationship communication clean throughout. So you always have empathy, attention, and respect for them. 
and are communicating clearly and with repetition. That's something I might add with these folks. It's not unusual that you need to repeat things several times for them to be absorbed. These folks tend to fear and expect conspiracies against them. And they may see the government as having a conspiracy against them. They may see you and your colleagues as having a conspiracy against them. This comes from inside of them, and you can't persuade them that there isn't a conspiracy against them. You can say there isn't, but then focus on empathizing with them. Say it must be hard to have that concern, um, but let's look at what we can do right now. A lot of it with these folks is moving on to what you can do for them rather than what you can't. So be reassuring to them. Don't be trying to threaten them to accomplish things. That's the real button uh, trigger for them. And let them know you don't have to do or know certain things, but again, that the policies require you to do certain things. So you really don't get stuck in arguing um, about who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad. You just say, my hands are tight, I can't do that, or this is a requirement I have to do. So this often can help uh, in calming these folks and trying to work with them. <clears throat> so let's look at, uh, let's see. I, I, yeah. I think we're going straight to a live poll now, um, Bill, just in terms of those questions of have you ever dealt with a high conflict personality? And we'd actually like our audience to vote. I think at the moment we've got 43 people online as part of the webinar, and this will be presented as a video presentation. So the first question that we have voting around is, have you dealt with a high conflict personality? Uh, and the responses are A or B. And Shiv, I'll just confirm that you're dealing with that live poll result. Yes, so that's our okay. first question. Yeah, so now that we've heard a bit more from Bill about what the different types of high conflict uh, behaviour are, we've just uh, got the poll to follow on from that. So I'll launch that now, um, and the attendees should see it come up on their screen. So if you could vote. We'll close it in a couple of seconds. It's been pretty quick. So we've had 90% of um, our attendees voting now, or 85%, so we'll just share the results. Um, but as, as we can see, Tanya, um, there's an overwhelming answer, so I'll, I'll yeah, hand back to yeah. you. <laughs> okay, no, but it, it, and it's not surprising. I mean, in a sense, it's a little different from um, the statistics that I think Justin had when he did a poll in relation to OIC matters. Um, but of course, I think most people within their family, their friend group, their workplace, aside from within the OIC and within the RTI context, have had high conflict personality issues. So it's a, a lovely lead in to one of the next segments that we're doing, which is really um, additional skills to deal with high conflict personalities. But we might just check on the frequency or the last time that people dealt with a high conflict personality. And we have another poll coming up now. So if you can just vote on this about whether in the last day, the last week, the last month, or the last year, and we'll just give it a couple of seconds for those poll results to come up. So Tanya, we've just got, um, we'll leave it open for a few more seconds, but most people are voting now. I'll be very interested to see the response to this one. I must say, I think most people, when they've had contact with a high conflict personality, retain that conflict. And many um, people, you know, don't sleep well, and it can have that impact on health that we talk about in the program. Okay, so we've got the same same amount of people who've voted again. So I'll share those results for you to see, Tanya. Well, they're, again, very interesting um, results because really they're suggesting that 
Um, for the majority of people within the last month, they've actually dealt with somebody with a high conflict personality. And this would make sense when you actually consider the percentage of the population which may fall into the existing DSM-4 criteria. Yeah, and it's, it was also interesting to see that I guess it's about over one in three of us has dealt with it in the last week. So definitely a very common issue that we're facing a lot of the practitioners that have signed in today. Um, okay, well we'll go back to the webinar now. So it should display the PowerPoint again. Great, thanks Shiv. And I think we're going to talk about some additional tips for managing high conflict personalities and also high conflict behaviour more generally. Now the first tip that appears is really connecting with the EAR and I think both Bill and I very much consider that that's a, a foundation method and it's a critical method that you can use all the way through. Yes, you can really use connecting with ear statements with all of these personalities. And one thing I want to mention is that there's a range of behavior. Some people have these personalities much more extreme than others, but they tend to be high conflict when they make things bigger rather than smaller in terms of disputes. And it's not surprising if we're looking at 15% or so of society that people are running into people with these high conflict personalities on a very regular basis. And of course, my belief from reading the research is that that's going to continue to increase somewhat. So having these kinds of skills will really be helpful going forward. And they're counterintuitive. They're not what you would usually think of or feel like doing. Even connecting with ear statements is something that is the opposite of what people feel like doing. They feel like strangling the person or hanging up or running away from them. So it takes some practice to learn these. So we've already talked about connecting with ear. The benefit of thinking of the CARS method, I think, is under pressure, it's easier to remember, okay, C-A-R-S. These are four choices I have for how to deal with high conflict people. And when we get to the case examples in a little bit, uh, we'll see applying these methods can be particularly helpful. So let's go to the second one, analyzing choices or proposals. What we find is high conflict personalities are focused on feelings and reactions. Therefore, if you can focus them on making choices or making a list, for example, writing a list helps pull them into their problem-solving parts of their brain more, something the average person can do on their own, but these folks seem to have a harder time doing. So basically, what you want to do is either ask them to write a list as one approach, or you can ask them to make a proposal. If you're, if you're having a dispute over how much information should be uh, released, sometimes asking, well, what do you propose? Especially when they're complaining or complaining about how you communicated with them or how long it took to respond, basically what you want to do is to, to get them thinking about it so that you can uh, have something for them to analyze. And by giving it back to them, saying, then what do you propose? That often helps. So when you ask them, so what do you propose? It gets them to think. Also, if if you're dealing with two people and one makes a proposal and the other doesn't like that, they can't just sit there and complain as then what's their proposal. This is a frequent technique that works well with a lot of high conflict people because it, it puts the burden on them to think through and solve the problem. Of course, in workplaces, often people say, if you're going to tell me about a problem, tell me a proposed solution. So this gets them thinking and analyzing. And now, go ahead. Again, and I'm just thinking, I mean, there's a lot of work that's been done on the fast brain and the slow brain, and yes. a lot of work which suggests that, um, you know, our fast brain is our more primitive brain. It's, 
it's quicker and it's what we use most of our processing time on. These types of techniques and in particular the list making and the really encouraging people to make a proposal are very much focused on trying to engage the rational part of the brain. Yes, and, and that's what you're trying to do because the average person can shift back and forth between getting upset and calming themselves down fairly quickly. And if they start overreacting, you catch yourself and you go, oh, wait a minute, I have to take another look at this. People with these personalities seem to have a harder time going from upset feelings to the logical problem solving. And there's actually some research that suggests that some of the parts of the brain may be a little bit smaller for people with personality disorders, such that it makes it harder to move from upset to problem solving. Now, whenever I mention that, people say, is there some way to strengthen that? And it does seem like some treatments for personality disorders that involve teaching them skills with a lot of repetition may actually help them no longer have this problem. So it, it partly may be actually a physiological in the brain um, limitation that makes it harder but you can direct which part of the brain is responding. As, as you said, Tanya, the slow part or the fast part, a lot of that's in response to how people relate to them. So these tips are designed to help uh, practitioners relate to them in a way that appeals more to the problem-solving brain and not to the fast defensive brain. Now this, this emphasis on if you hear a proposal, just think about it, yes, no, or I'll think about it as a response, also helps them stay calm. Asking questions like, what's your picture of how, what this would look like? And if they don't like a proposal, proposing something else. The idea here is these are different techniques you could use. Writing a list, asking for proposals, uh, but no one in particular is the right answer, and some just might not fit some situations. Like you don't necessarily want to ask for a proposal if you already know it's going to be pretty extreme. Uh, the other thing is narrowing things down to choices and consequences, which we're going to get to. Let me talk now briefly about the R of the CARS method, and that's how to respond to hostility so that you avoid a power struggle. And there's several phrases that you can use that, that don't accept the challenge that high conflict people repeatedly give you to start a fight. So when they say something, you can say, you might be right. I wasn't there. Let's focus on what we can do today. Here's how I can help you today. So it's not a direct challenge to the way they think, and it's not engaging in the fight. Uh, I find often I can just shrug my shoulder and say, you might be right. You know, I'll never know. I wasn't there. Uh, let's look at what we can do now. Also, uh, there's, there's a method uh, we call BIF responses, B-I-F-F. And this is especially helpful when you're uh, corresponding electronically, whether it's by email or some other form, uh, or written letters. Keep them brief. Focus on straight information. Have a friendly greeting in closing to keep the tone positive, And firm. That means you end the discussion or you give two choices with a deadline. And we have more examples with that, uh, an article called Responding to Hostile Mail. There's also uh, a book that I've written called Biff, Quick Responses to High Conflict People, that explains this much more. It's becoming such a big problem these days, and you can turn those conversations around. What I find is people feel good about themselves when they've written a Biff response rather than feeling agitated and like they got down in the mud with the other person. This is a way to stay out of the mud and just basically uh, keep it matter of fact. Now one thing I want to always say here is keep in mind, I recognize that in Australia, a biff means a fight. <laughs> and so I want to suggest this is a biff response. So if the other person's trying to start a fight with you, 
rather than fighting back, is it's responding to a BIF in a way that doesn't continue the fight. So that's one thing I learned when I was down uh, in, in Melbourne a couple of years ago. Now the last one is setting limits by explaining choices and consequences. And with this, high conflict people take a lot of things personally. And so I've kind of hinted at this before with the different personalities. You want it not to be personal. So the more that you can make it external and say, the law requires me to do this, or our policies prevent me from doing that, that's really much more helpful in terms of these folks because it doesn't make it a personal attack on them. And they are so used to being personally attacked and just escalate and make it more difficult. So this, this way you're working with them, not against them. And just whatever it is, if, if there isn't a policy on the issue but you think there should be, say I'll get back to you in a day or two and then go make a policy. Uh, because one thing we know with high conflict people is they find the loopholes, they find the gaps, and we do actually get better policies as we work uh, with these folks. So this is basically another way of helping them. So this is uh, the four cars connecting, analyzing, responding, and setting limits. Now there's a lot of high conflict people that may have had an abusive history and so they're used to uh, not having an influence over how things happen to them. But nowadays we also have a lot of people who feel entitled and no one's ever set limits with them. And if we take a look at the next slide, we get to see an example of that. Basically, people aren't used to um, having to have people say no to them. You may be the first person who's saying no to them. So don't be surprised about that. Just follow through and be consistent. So for example, this guy says, to be frank, officer, my parents never set boundaries. And so now you're seeing people starting to have consequences. And in a sense, this is what you're doing when you're setting limits, saying what information they can have, all of that. They don't like that because they're not used to people saying no. So in your calm, matter of fact, empathy, attention, and respect statement, you're saying, sorry, but I can't do that. The policies and the law prevent me from doing so. So that's basically the idea here, is when you're setting limits, you can use ear statements and let them know, I can understand, uh, this could be frustrating, and emphasize they have a choice. It's up to you. Here's the consequences of these two choices, but it's up to you. So for example, the guy in the flower shop in the first cartoon is you could say, you know, if you send those flowers, that's third party contact and you'll go to jail. But it's up to you. And you can use that when you say no to people. Now, let's talk about high conflict representatives because people are reporting more problems like that. Many of them may, uh, some may have a high conflict personality, but the majority generally are emotionally hooked in um, because of the intense emotions of high conflict people, which are very contagious. Uh, so they're hooked in, but they're uninformed. So part of it is just educating them about the situation, letting them know this is how it is, this is what you can do, what you can't do. In general, use these exact same methods, ear statements, help them analyze their <clears throat> options, respond to misinformation or hostile information, and also set limits with empathy, attention, and respect, telling them what you can do and what you can't do. So take a similar approach. I've found that in many disputes that if I approach high conflict representatives as a high conflict person, they often become cooperative. Of course, don't let them know that's what you're doing. Now, we also have uh, the repeat applicants. 
And these are really very likely they're high conflict personalities because they have a hard time stopping themselves and they feel desperate to get other people to change because they're not solving their own problems. Remember, being logical with them is just going to miss the issue. They're not thinking logically. Uh, they're not focused on the past, on their own behavior. So it's better matter of fact, calm, focus on what they can do, what their choices are, and what the consequences are. Over time, put less and less emotional energy into them because that's very reinforcing. If you get angry or frustrated, that really escalates them. So in general, with them too, just keep it brief, informative, friendly, and firm. Say less and less and hopefully they will slowly disengage. It sometimes takes quite a while, but if you express frustration, that re-engages them. So try to limit the expression of frustration with them. Okay, so basically this is the informational part we wanted to give you. Think of cars when you're under pressure with them, connecting, analyzing, responding, and setting limits. I find this really helps under pressure because it's hard to remember a lot of stuff. Bill, um, before you summarize, I might read out a couple of the questions we've received throughout your presentation, if that's okay? That would be great. Okay, wonderful. Well, one of the questions we received earlier from Amy was, when do you move to restricting contact at writing? Um, so what other options are there for managing your interactions over a course of a complaint process? without having to restrict to writing, particularly... I lost some sound here. Are you hearing me? I lost some sound. No, I'm hearing you. Okay, hearing you. I will um, um, I'll type got, the I lost question in as for well. you. But I, I think the question is sometimes in the RTI context, what happens is that they will move to a process where effectively um, they require the applicant or somebody else even to put everything in writing because it's just too difficult to try and deal with them verbally. And I'm just, uh, I think Shiv's question or rather Amy's question was really around whether or not that works and um, whether or not there are other things that you might try. And if you do move to a all in writing approach, whether or not there are any specific tips that might be more helpful than others. And I well, think we're just going to look at a couple of questions before we look at the case studies, is my hello. understanding. Sorry, can you hear me sure. now? Yes, I do. I hear you now. And Sorry, I, Bill. I, I, um, did you hear the question I read out from Amy? I, I think I got most of it, so let me start answering it and see if I missed anything. Sure. I think the question of going from personal communication in person to written communication uh, can be one helpful way of of reducing the intensity for them and just saying from now on I think it would be more helpful if uh, I could, could communicate in writing with you, see what you have to say and respond. And I understand our face-to-face -face conversations have eventually become uh, frustrating and so I, I think it might be easier for you if I were to communicate in writing now. So you make it kind of a solution for them. Um, if you're too abrupt, that's the key with things, is try not to be abrupt. Just always have empathy, attention, and respect, and say, I mean, if, the, if you have a choice, is you could say, well, I'll leave it up to you. Would you rather speak in person or, you know, through email? If it's not up to you, if, if you don't feel you want to give them that choice, is to just slowly phase them to you know, given my current job obligations, I'm going to have to focus now by email rather than in-person meetings. So talk about it matter-of-factly as, as a problem to solve that's not because of them or because of you as much as possible. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's, that's great. Thanks, Bill. Um, we've received three other questions, but I think the answers to the questions that we've received will be covered off when we um, go through.
end. Um, I think we've lost you again. I think what time, have time we have. <coughs> um, and if, if you're both ready, we, can, we can move on to the case studies. Um, set of case studies and that the answers may fall out of the case studies. I'd actually like to see what some of those questions are, just in case um, by the end of this we haven't adequately responded to it. But what I'd suggest we might do now while, while Shiv is um, just dealing with a slight technical problem is maybe move through to the case studies or the case scenarios. And um, I think that most of you should have received a package in relation to those case studies. Um, just while Shiv is getting the slide up, I might just introduce the case study slide and so that we can start talking about them. So what we've actually done is produced a series of very brief case studies or case scenarios and we have actors who will be giving us, I think, some input into them. Um, Shiv, your sound is a little bit funny so I might just get you to check in and make sure that sound is okay. Yeah, Tanya, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well now. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'll just play the uh, first case study. Applicant Frodo was formerly an employee of your agency. His employment was terminated some time ago due to his ongoing harassment of co-workers. You have established from court documents that Frodo has an acquired brain injury following a recent stroke. While Frodo has always expressed distrust for your agency, he believes that the stress caused by the termination of his employment caused his stroke. Frodo has consistently disputed the circumstances of his employment being terminated. These circumstances are not familiar to you. However, you understand this has led Frodo to distrust your agency and its officers. Frodo is known for persistently calling and emailing various agency officers and harassing them on the telephone. He has also appeared at the agency's customer service centres on a number of occasions and demanded to speak to the service desk manager about his employment. Following the termination of Frodo's employment, he had a marriage breakdown and no longer sees his children. He blames your agency for this also. Frodo makes an application for any and all documents in your agency that mention him or relate to him in any way. Before starting to process this application, you will need to refine the scope of Frodo's request. Great, thanks, thanks very much, Shiv. Um, it, it, this type of um, application <coughs> and the behaviours that we've become aware of really highlight a number of uh, different issues. And acquired brain injury is particularly um, problematic. I think we've got a series of questions that help us in terms of both our diagnosis and also um, can be actually, uh, I think, given to Bill to help him consider the responses that might be helpful in this uh, particular scenario. So I'm just wondering, in terms of that, uh, and understanding that this is somebody with an acquired brain injury, but of course we don't really understand the extent of the brain injury, and it appears that as a result of that or indeed other factors, there have been a number of significant relationship breakdowns. Uh, that Frodo has experienced. So I'm just wondering, Bill, in terms of this particular applicant, what do you think the best technique is to gain some useful information from Frodo and help to narrow his series of requests? I think the most important thing here is to start out with connecting with him and giving him some ear statements. Um, I've worked in psychiatric hospitals with people with brain injuries and what's interesting is what people with personality disorders struggle with and people with brain injuries struggle with is the, the difficulty in managing their own emotions and having the emotions take over and not having a way to calm them. So if you can speak calmly to him and and empathize with his situation. You know, it sounds very frustrating. Uh, and the way I can help you today is to look at how we might narrow this request so that it will be given uh, full attention. And so I'd like to help you with that. If you can give me uh, some information that might help me in doing that, or uh, or I'll tell you what I need to about how we might refine your request. So really, you really want to give the impression you're on the same team. Let's solve this problem together. Let's work together to resolve this. 
And that will be real important uh, because if, if he's got the brain injury, like I said, some people with personality disorders have some brain limitations. Uh, and so this is, this is a really important piece. I just think with all of your situations that the first thing to think of is trying to calm the person by being on the same team. And I suppose you're going to the second question. If Frodo starts to harass you during the discussion or behaves in an appropriate manner, how might you respond to that? There's, there's two responses to this, really depending on the situation. One response, especially with someone with a brain injury but also personality problems, is to decide, is this a battle that's worth fighting? In other words, if their, their harassing behavior may be related to their frustration underneath. And if you can pay attention to the frustration underneath, sometimes the harassing behavior goes away. We know these are people generally who have difficulties. So that just confronting directly on that that behavior is not acceptable may frustrate them further, feed into the cycle of high conflict thinking, and they may get more upset rather than less. So one option is to ignore that surface behavior and focus on what's the frustration underneath. But if you do feel that it's appropriate or necessary to focus on the behavior, is basically try to focus on giving choices and consequences. So you might say, now you're speaking to me in a very uh, angry tone of voice, which I'm having a hard time listening to right now. So I'm going to need to end the phone call unless we can change the tone of this discussion. Um, it's up to you. And I'll give you, you know, a few seconds to think about it and then decide whether we can proceed a little more calmly or whether I should stop the call now and we should talk to each other later. So the idea is give them a choice and of course if they continue to speak in a harassing tone you might then say okay I see you've chosen to have me talk about this later so I'm going to be hanging up now but I will be available again tomorrow if we can try this a little more calmly. Have a good evening and goodbye. So setting limits by giving choices and consequences may be uh, sometimes necessary. And as I said, other times you may just ignore the behavior and focus on the problem that's underneath. And Bill, uh, the last question is really around, should you try and manage his expectations by actually telling him that he's not going to get most of the documents that he's seeking? And at what point might you do that? Yeah, that's, expectations are a big issue with high conflict personalities because they tend towards this all or nothing thinking. They think they're going to win big or they're going to lose big. So I think, again, matter of factly, you could slip into the, into the conversation that, of course, uh, we don't always get what we want in our applications and so let's just do the best job we can and then see what the outcome is um, because this is an area that's got a whole lot of rules and regulations about it and we need to follow those. So it's always possible that some of this information won't be forthcoming, uh, but let's see what we can do. So that's one way you could say it if, you're, uh, if you want to address that issue. Another is to realize that regardless of what you say, they're going to be upset when the news comes. And, and the average person, you might say, now remember I told you last month that you might not get everything you want. High conflict people don't remember. Um, all they're doing is reacting in the present. So, Bill, I might just, sorry Bill, I might just interrupt quickly. We just had a question um, from the audience back, back in relation to the second point we discussed um, where Frodo was uh, behaving inappropriately and aggressively. Um, one of our attendees have asked if at the stage where your conversation becomes quite heated and um, he's become aggressive, he requests a meeting with the RTI officer or at any stage during 
um, your conversations, if Frodo requests the meeting with you directly, um, would you refuse the meeting given his history? How, how would you usually respond to such a request? Let me see if I understand. So would you have a meeting with uh, someone who's higher up? Is that the question because of their behavior? No, I think Frodo would like you, um, as the RTI officer, to meet with him um, face to face. I see. Well, if, if the behavior is coming, becoming uh, belligerent, and this is a judgment call because it depends on the situation that you're in um, and whether or not you feel that it's going to be uh, beneficial. What you could do is say, at this time, um, I'm not going to do that because uh, it seems too upsetting to you. And so I think we're going to need to calm down, perhaps talk about this again in a week or so. In some cases, meeting in person, you can calm people down better because it includes your, um, your, your interpersonal uh, contact so that you can be more calming. So it depends on your experience with that particular person whether you want to be personal or whether you want to keep a removed distance. If you keep the distance, you need to say, it seems upsetting right now to you, and I think it'd be better if we just took a break, rather than trying to meet in person. Uh, in another scenario, a different Frodo, you might say, you know, that's a good idea. Let's go ahead and meet in person. Of course, if they're very agitated, See, one of the problems is they get agitated and then they stop being agitated. So they may be not agitated a week from now, but real agitated now. So that's part of why it's that judgment call. You're never going to be able to predict with some of these folks if you're going to get the good mood or the bad mood. Uh, so, so those are factors to consider. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Well, I might sure. play the next scenario, um, scenario two. Oh, let me, before you go further, let me just quickly say something on the third question about expectations. And that is something you can do with these folks about several questions. And that is, say, do you want me to tell you what some of the possible outcomes are? And if Frodo says yes, then you can say some of the outcomes are you might not get what you want at all. You might get some of what you want, or you might get all of what you want. Most commonly, um, it's not all of what you want, uh, but it may be some of what you want. So the idea is ask them if they want to know. And if they say no, then you skip giving them the information about what to expect. Great. OK, let's go ahead. Wonderful. You send a document search request to Manager Mayhem of your agency. Within a minute of receiving your email, Manager Mayhem calls you and asks you many questions about who the applicant is and why they want the particular information. While it is not your usual practice to include the name of the applicant in your search request, you explain to Manager Mayhem that the applicant is from the media. Manager Mayhem then asks you many questions and interrupts you as you try to answer them. Manager Mayhem then accuses you of being elusive and obstructionist. Manager Mayhem tells you that you have no understanding of the political pressure facing your agency and that there is no circumstance in which they can give you the documents. Manager Mayhem says that if you continue to insist on having the documents, she will make sure that the documents do not exist. So this scenario, scenario we have here is just an example of a possible difficult behaviour that RTI practitioners can encounter from internal stakeholders. So just to begin with, I'll, I might hand over to Bill in this scenario whether you would continue speaking to Manager Mayhem? Well, it's, it's a good question. First of all, uh, I think this reinforces the uh, point that was brought up earlier, I think, by Tanya, which is that we may not just be dealing with high-conflict applicants but sometimes we're going to be dealing with others, with professionals, outsiders, who have similar issues. Now, it may be this person is just defensive in the situation, and it may be that they have a high-conflict personality. 
In either case, I think that abruptly terminating the conversation may be counterproductive because it just tends to escalate these folks. I think it's better to try to calmly say, uh, you know, my, my hands are tied on this. I need to make this request. Uh, and of course, your response is up to you, but it is something that's a formal request with formal requirements. And I can understand it's frustrating and maybe awkward, but I still need to proceed. Uh, my hands are tied on this. I think that kind of thing may be helpful. I would back up and suggest that if you have the option that you not mention that the applicant is from the media, uh, that may be fanning the flames to say anything about the applicant, including what occupation they have. I think it may be better to just say, you know, I'm not allowed to say who the applicant is. And I understand that can be frustrating, but I'm sorry I can't do that. Is there any other questions you want to address to me? Something like that. Bill, I'm looking at the second question. Um, and if, if the manager refuses to stop asking you questions, and it's really, again, about ending that conversation, and I know very much a lot of your work suggests that many people who have high conflict uh, personalities have had a series of bad endings. That is that they're often abruptly terminated um, when they have conversations with people. And if you do the same thing with them, then that can trigger um, a recollection of all of those bad endings. But I'm just wondering, in terms of that asking you questions and techniques that could be used, I'm wondering whether list making could be a useful technique there if somebody does seem to have a series of questions and whether or not you might use that technique to try and pull manager may mayhem back into the conversation in a more constructive way. I think that's a great idea. And a, a way not to be too abrupt is to say, you know, you've, you've got several questions right now. And it may be helpful if you would put those in an email or put those in a letter to me. And then I'll respond as best I can. I understand this can be frustrating, and there's so much information that you're asking. Uh, I, I can't really you know, answer those in this phone call, but perhaps if you could make a list, I'd be glad to respond as best as I can, realizing some questions, of course, I can't answer. I think that kind that's a respectful answer without feeding or tolerating the uh, endless questions. So I, I, I think that would be a good application right there of this method. And in terms of three, it really goes to the setting limits, setting boundaries uh, comment that, that you had before, that sometimes you need to set limits and explain um, what the boundaries are in terms of a conversation. And yes. in this one, I mean, it's a bit jurisdictional specific, I think. But the question is, um, how do you explain to manager Mayhem that what they propose to do would constitute misconduct. I take it from what you've previously said about guidelines and um, setting boundaries, that what you would say would be, would it be helpful if I explained what the law says? And the law requires me to do a number of things. And the law requires um, that certain conduct can be viewed as misconduct. And it might be helpful to actually go through what those guidelines are. Would, would that be the sort of way that you would respond in relation to three? Yes, I think, I think there's two important aspects of that. One is talking about it out there. In other words, the law requires certain things. It could be interpreted as misconduct to not provide the information or have the information disappear. But also the idea is asking if they want to know what the law is. Uh, because giving them a choice gets them thinking and also is uh, focusing them on the positive rather than the negative, getting them to participate in the solution. But one way or another, I think it would be helpful to say that under the current state of the law, that could be construed as misconduct by some people. So it, it may be something you want to be careful about in terms of having information disappear or not providing it. Um, I just want you to know that. Let me know if you have any more questions about that. Thanks, Bill. And I think it is a difficult conversation. But again, it's not actually the person dealing with the telephone call. 
who's taking it back and saying, I will report you for misconduct, but it's very much about saying these are the external requirements and it might be helpful for you to understand what those external requirements are. Now, one issue that's arisen in a number of the two-day programs, in fact all of them, has been, and, and you can see it, it really flows very naturally from the poll questions as well, uh, that people are frequently experiencing you know, high conflict behaviour and difficult behaviour. And if you have a difficult discussion like that, I'm just wondering whether you've got any tips about how you might debrief. Um, and uh, I suppose debrief from a mental health perspective, but also from a perspective of, of your skills and process understanding. Well, I think there's two things. One is having a conversation with someone who's confidential, who you're allowed to talk to about the issue. So another practitioner or someone in the organization. Because this kind of work can be very stressful, and you feel isolated. And it's good to know that you're really dealing with something other people have dealt with before. So you don't want to be out on the limb alone. But you want it to be confidential and know that what you're saying isn't going to get out to other people uh, that you're complaining. It's more just venting uh, to someone who understands just like you do. So one is having a conversation. The other sometimes helpful thing to do is, is write uh, notes after a conversation like that. And just the process of writing helps generally calm people and put them more in a problem-solving mode. And so if you write some journal notes about it, it helps you not feel as overwhelmed and may give you a chance to get some perspective on what it is that's been happening. So I, I would suggest either of those ways of debriefing. The, the hardest thing is to not talk about it, not write about it, and just stuff your feelings. And that tends to kind of erode into your next day and a half of uh, having a hard time sleeping or getting grumpy with family members, et cetera. So I do think debriefing, these can be traumatic conversations. And debriefing could be very helpful. And I think one, one matter that we mentioned in the two-day program as well was that if something was sticking with you for a while, you might actually need to have more help in terms of debriefing. And that, you know, it really is an occupational health and safety issue in that if you've had a series of difficult conversations, if you like, the stress can accumulate a bit. Um, but aside from that, sometimes they are difficult and sometimes, uh, you know, very sad uh, matters that you might be dealing with and that you might actually need to get some help yourself to make sure that you can respond appropriately and that these matters aren't sticking with you for a longer period of time. Yeah. Now, I, I think we're moving on to our next Actually, uh, before we move uh, on, I had yeah. one more comment about what, what you just said that I think is helpful. Sometimes it's helpful to do a role play with somebody else, a colleague, about this and say, here's what I said, here's what they said, Let's see if we can try some different approaches so that you actually get to reenact it but feel that you've got some new strategies. Uh, I find role playing really helpful in preparing for difficult conversations and also coping afterwards. So that's just a thought and colleagues could do that with each other. Okay, I'm ready to move on. Sorry, I might just interrupt. Uh, can, you, can you both hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Um, we just had one question earlier on. Um, it applies to Frodo and Manager Mayhem, and I think it sort of ties into being prepared for the call um, and having a way to debrief as well. But is there any way um, you can look for some early signs uh, for when you think you'll be dealing with someone that's going to be displaying high, of high conflict personality? Um, for example, is, would you do some research on the person, ask some questions, or just look at the tone of their email? Um, how, how could you, is there any like tricks on finding some early signs? <laughs> for it's, it, it's an excellent question, and it's coming up more and more, as I think these, these folks are increasing in society. And, and the answer is yes and no. To some extent, you don't see this coming because people with high conflict personalities are just as intelligent as everybody else, can be successful in, in parts of their lives, and be able to uh, behave appropriately until there's a crisis or something 
triggers this stuff that's underneath. So some of the time you just know, have no idea, and it's good to approach uh, the type of situation with an open-mindedness. This could be a high-conflict person, and if so, I need to use these alternate strategies and not try for insight, but focus on empathy, attention, respect, and choices and consequences, etc. Sometimes you can tell, partly by the nature of the situation, like where you have a repeat applicant. So if you have the same application five times, that's a real good sign you're dealing with a high-conflict person. Um, sometimes just all or nothing thinking, especially in emails uh, or other written correspondence, uh, blaming. If there's a lot of blaming statements, that's a sign of a high-conflict person. Uh, that they're 100% it's all your fault or the agency's fault or the office's fault and that they're a totally innocent victim. Uh, victim language is often a sign uh, because the average person, even if they've been a victim in some situations, doesn't go around proudly talking about it. High conflict people proudly tell you how they've been taken advantage of by other people and want to get your sympathies that way. Um, and they make that a very repetitive behavior. So I think the all or nothing thinking, um, unmanaged emotions sometimes, uh, and blaming behavior, very common uh, characteristics. And if you see some of that, then be prepared. I, I have a, a, an additional comment on, on that, Shiv, and I agree with yeah. everything that, that Bill has said. But one marker that, that I particularly use is if, if a person um, speaks uninterrupted for more than three or four minutes and in a sense their focus is on themselves only or blaming others but not, not able to show, if you like, any second person perspective um, and there's no slowing down of speech and no moving into any second person and sometimes that's a bit of a, a cue for me that there might be some underlying issues with that person. And that inability to move even with some questions around what they consider the other person was doing or thinking or, or, or whether they understand what the uh, departmental response was. If those questions really, uh, I ask them and I'm not getting much of a response, then I, I begin to think, well, uh, this person is very much focused on themselves and on their own reactions and responses. And so that may be a cue for me as well. That's a very good point, yes. Very common. Great. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next case scenario, if you're both ready. Yes, yes. thanks, um, Shiv. I'm just noting the time, and I think we'll probably have to move through this one fairly quickly and just check if there's any questions at the end as well. Yeah, we've just got a, a handful of questions that we haven't answered through already what we've discussed, um, but we'll, we'll try and get to them at the end. Alternatively, um, we can send an email just answering them as best as we can after the webinar as well. Um, so I'll, I'll play the next case scenario. Thank you. Applicant Hermione is well known to your agency. She has for some time conducted an unauthorized pet snake breeding business from her garage. She owns a number of snake species. Some of her pets are registered, however the snake breeding business is not. On a number of occasions, your agency's officers have entered Hermione's property and seized snakes that she has bred. The snakes that have been confiscated from Hermione have been put down by your agency in accordance with the relevant legal requirements. From your correspondence with Hermione, you realize that she has significant difficulty with written English. You also read in your agency's records that Hermione has a history of drug and alcohol abuse. Hermione has made at least five access applications in as many months. Each application seeks information about your agency's animal management practices and she believes that your agency keeps a secret file on snake management. Hermione has been told on multiple occasions that your agency does not have any secret snake management file. She has now made an application for a record of all situations in the past 10 years where your agency has confiscated and put down any reptiles. You call Hermione to clarify the scope of her request. Once you explain that her current request is too broad, Hermione starts crying uncontrollably and then apologizes profusely and asks you not to end the call. 
She puts you on hold for a minute, and then resumes the call again, sobbing quietly. As you start speaking, Hermione starts crying again, and tells you how overcome by grief she is following the confiscation of her pet snakes. She starts telling you about her traumatic childhood, her life as a snake breeder, and her dealings with your agency over the past 10 years. I already feel, <laughs> if you want to jump in, a difficult conversation and somebody who's clearly uh, very upset and may have a number of communication problems. And I'm just wondering in terms of that first question is should you continue telephone discussions with Hermione? I think that this would be in terms of a, an initial phone call where, she, where it goes like this, that uh, you know, you should have a patient tone of voice, be empathetic, empathy, attention, and respect. Uh, clearly, she got some mental health problems, inability to manage her emotions. Uh, she's stuck if she's been dealing with this for 10 years. So the first time you have a conversation with her is show the empathy, attention, and respect, and and let her know there's some things we just can't talk about. They've already been discussed. They've already been addressed. Uh, so in a sense, start out with a fairly ordinary conversation, answering questions, matter of fact, empathy, attention, and respect. If you continue getting these kinds of phone calls, is shortening them and shortening them and then switching over to written correspondence. Someone like this is not going to change regardless of what you say uh, unless they're in some kind of treatment program. Uh, she's, she's really out of control with herself and so you, you mostly just want to be respectful but don't get, don't get stuck. Uh, don't, don't stay engaged. This is someone to slowly disengage with. I'm just wondering if we might go to the next slide, um, partly because I think it highlights an issue because she has difficulty with communicating in writing. And the next slide reveals, uh, I think, a, a somewhat more paranoid personality in that she's concerned about communicating in English, but she's also concerned, I think, about any records of the communication going forward. So yeah, she's so if we could yeah, I'll... Through. I'll keep playing the next part of the recording, so I'll play Thank that you. now. Okay, great. Shortly after you call, you send Hermione an email confirming your discussion. Hermione calls you from an untraceable number. She tells you that she believes all her posts and emails are being scanned by your agency and that she has no privacy. She instructs you not to send her any letters and to only telephone her. She tells you that when you are ready to give her documents, she will come and get them herself. And my, my thinking with this is really depends on what the uh, policies are. And if you can, say, that's up to you. I won't send you more letters. Uh, however, our, our phone calls are really going to have to, uh, to stop because I have put time into explaining these issues and we, we are starting to repeat some of your concerns and when that happens I've been told that I really can't continue to keep uh, telephoning the person, um, that I need to put it in writing. However, what I can do is just put a physical letter in your file and if you ever want to know what those letters are, uh, you can come down to the office and, and we can give them to you. But if you're choosing to not have me mail those or email those to you, uh, that's fine. Our policy allows us to just keep them here in the office. So that's, that's one approach if the policies allow that. I think with someone like this, you don't want to, to, to spend a lot of time on the telephone. So that request isn't one you can honor. I uh, say, I wish I could, but we've, we've had four conversations, and the policy is I really shouldn't have four conversations. More than that, on this subject, since it has been fully discussed. So I really can understand your frustration. I respect your caution that you don't want these emailed to you, and, and I'll no longer do that. But they will be in our file 
if you ever want to come in and be handed those. I don't know if that fits what your policies are, but that approach is what I would take. I, I think in a way also she's, she's almost invited that when she says, you know, do not send me any letters, only telephone me. But then she says at the same time I'll come and get the documents myself. So the option of her picking up any uh, documents or any letters is one that she's actually put forward herself. Yeah, Great. and you might say in respect for your approach too, we can abide by that if you can. If there's a policy that says you can't do that, then you tell her the policy and see what other choices she has. I think the general principles are that you diminish contact with her, but do it respectfully and do it with choices and tell her what the alternatives are. And I think that this highlights a very important piece of the two-day program as well, and that is that you can't negotiate everything, and that's really why we have strong rights-based systems in place. Not everything can be negotiated. Some matters have to go to other levels. And it really is a choice uh, on your side about which matters can be negotiated. I suppose one of the things that both Bill and I are saying is that there are a lot of reasons why you would negotiate with some people with high conflict behaviours because they're repeat applicants and sometimes you can be successful in terms of negotiating outcomes. And those successes can be very useful for the future because they may diminish the amount of applications that you get and also diminish the wear and tear on your agency as well as others. But it's not always going to be possible. And there are some points where you have to have a clear line and a boundary drawn. Yeah, setting limits is so common and important of an issue with these folks. So I, I totally agree. You can't negotiate everything with them and don't imply that you can. Excellent. We might and, use the last five minutes, sorry Tanya, we might use the last five minutes to go through a couple of the questions if you just want to finish off what you were going to say. Um, I, and then that's I'll what I was going out. to say, Shiv, I was going to say oh, okay. if you have any questions, let's turn to those because I just want to make sure that we do cover them. Great. Um, okay. Well, one of the questions that Lisa asked uh, about an hour ago, sorry Lisa, is um, what, what do you do when a proposal that's made by an applicant um, or a third party or an internal stakeholder is illegal or outside your jurisdiction and you've explained it to them but they just won't accept that as an answer? I, th I think the thing is explaining something and then if they keep persisting is saying, you know, I, I can understand your frustration, but I'm, I'm not allowed to keep discussing something that's already been answered just because of the limitations we have in terms of time with different clients is or applicants. Uh, we are going to have to move on. Do you have a new issue for me? Um, and I'd be happy to address that. Otherwise, I think it is a good time for us to bring our conversation to a close. So. It, it's, you don't have to keep answering the same questions. I think it really helps to think of phasing out discussions with these folks because high conflict people want attention and they will take it wherever they can get it. And what's interesting is they particularly like government agencies because they feel that you're required to pay attention to them. But the reality is you're required to pay attention within certain limitations and that you can share with them those limitations. And if you don't have policies about how long you can talk to a high conflict person or to someone on an issue, you may want to get a policy about that. Uh, and you can refer to the policy. You know, once I've answered questions on an issue, I'm expected to move to other issues and then move to other cases. So I've really done what I can and we're going to need to wind down this conversation now. Something like that. Again, I think the way that Bill demonstrates the response to that issue, really showing empathy and not triggering and I'm going to hang up now, but it's, it's a much more um, phased down and careful response to that final query. Great. We might just have time for one more question, um, but it might be a good one to end on as well. And it's about the business strategy um, that we were discussing before. Um, I think we presented the BIF strategy earlier in the context of 
emails um, in writing. And Victoria's just asked whether that strategy can be used in ver verbal exchanges as well. Yes. And it's interesting, I was just actually speaking to a judge recently who was at one of my seminars a couple of years ago, and she said, I still use the BIF response uh, with each case that comes into my courtroom. I try to be brief, informative, friendly, and firm. So yes, I think you can use it in verbal conversations. The difference between ear statements and BIF responses is that ear statements show more empathy and make an emphasis on connecting with the person uh, with empathy, attention, and respect. BIF is, because it was designed for writing, tends to not have the same engagement uh, emotionally with the person that you have the opportunity for in person. So if you find you're doing BIF in person, that's fine, but if, if you're not getting enough of a connection, then you might emphasize empathy, attention, and respect as well. But yes, you can, all of these, keep in mind, all of these are tools that one might work sometimes with one person but not another, so you've got several tools now that you can try. All of these, as Tanya said, are part of good communication, and you want to emphasize these kind of approaches with high-conflict people Whereas ordinary people, you might be able to use reason and logic and get right to the point. With these folks, you really need to pay more attention to these emotional issues to help calm them down and then move forward with them. And I've only got one comment about the friendly firm um, part of this, which I think is very important. And that is, although you may feel quite agitated as a result of the conversation that you've had, and if it's been a difficult one, I think it actually takes quite a bit of work to make sure that you're maintaining a friendly and firm piece of the, the bit. And it, that requires a little bit of practice. And I think listening to Bill's voice in the course of this webinar is really interesting. He's got that lovely, um, gentle, friendly tone. And it's that time that you need to make sure that you're cultivating if you are using a BIF response in an oral response to, to an issue. Great. Thank yes. you very much, Bill and Tanya. Um, we've gotten through all our questions uh, today, except for one, but we'll, we'll get on to that one later. Um, so at the moment, we've recorded uh, the webinar that we've had this morning, um, and we hope uh, to make it available shortly for the participants and any of your colleagues that might also be interested in listening to it later on. Um, if you do have any questions that you think of um, you know, just after the webinar, please send it across, and um, we will try and email respond to it uh, by email today, um, but otherwise we can make the recording available. Um, aside from that, thank you very much again, Bill and Tanya, uh, for your great presentation, very useful for all of us. Um, and thank you to the thank attendees you. for your patience in dealing with our technical issues at the start. Um, but hopefully it all came together in the end. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, and now it's up to you. Good luck with everything. <laughs> and good luck with it all.